Welcome to the online ministry of Faith Christian Fellowship. FCF is a dynamic word and spirit empowered church where faith and family meet. If you would like more information about our church or other media resources, please visit us at faithchristianfellowship.com. We hope you enjoy this message. God. Well, turn your Bible tonight to 1 Samuel 17. We started a series last uh, started a series last week called Sticks and Stones. And uh, basically this this is a a a, um, a message on covenant. And uh, you know, I don't it's just going to take a little while to kind of get through this. I believe it's real important that we understand what covenant is. Because if you don't understand covenant, you really don't understand the foundation of your faith. You've got to understand covenant. So, so I want you to, to see some things as we move through. Uh, 1 Samuel 17, we'll jump in the mix here at verse 26. We know what's going on. David and Goliath and the army of Israel and the armies of the Philistines were encamped around basically uh, opposite each other. The valley of Elah was between them. And, you know, Goliath came out, he's shouting, he's cursing, he's, he's defying God, blaspheming God. David comes down on a bread and cheese run from his, from his, paw, uh, from his paw to come down and say, hey, go check out my bro- the brothers. Well, you know, it, it was 40 days. I mean, you know what I'm saying? They've been doing this for 40 days. I'm sure the dad got kind of concerned. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, they've been, they don't ever really take this long, you know. But Israel's scared to death. They're hiding out in the camp. And uh, then we pick up the mix here in verse 26. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this what? Uncircumcised Philistine that that he should defy the armies of the living God. Verse 30, uh, verse 35. And I went out after it. He talking about here. Talking about David said he went out after the the lion and the bear. And I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear and this uncircumcised Philistine. Again, he tells he says uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies. Of the living God. Now let's skip down here to verse 40. Then he took his staff in his hand. And he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. And put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch. Which he had. And his sling was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. When the Philistine looked about and saw David. He disdained him. For he was only a youth ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with the sword and with the spear and with the javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines, the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Man, that's some strong words right there. Come on, that was some, that was some, good, that's some, that's some good talk right there. That's some good, right, smacking down. I do, I'm going to tell you something. I love David because David actually was prophesying about how he was going to actually kill him. He had no sword in his hand. He had a stick and he had a, some stones. That's all he had. But he was prophesying, listen, I'm going to take your head off of you. I'm gonna, listen, God, I'm going to cut your head off. David talked, he talked Goliath to death. You know how you, you, know how you destroy your mountains? You got to talk to him. You know how you're going to kill him? You know what your stones are? It's your tongue. It's your praise. Right? Your songs are your stones. David, David said, I, you give me the songs in the night, in the dark season. It's the words, it's, it's praise that, we're, that, 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 that becomes our stones. Amen? So you know the story. It, it's a great story. You can read it. But I want you to realize that David was pulling on covenant. Okay? He automatically said, who's this uncircumcised Philistine? 
Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He said, this man don't have a covenant with God, and I got a covenant with God. He doesn't have a covenant with God. You guys got a covenant with God. What are you doing hiding out back here? So he pulled on covenant. Covenant is very, very, very powerful. Okay, it's very, very, very powerful. And we have to understand what covenant is. Now, God has a secret. In Psalm 25, why don't you put that up on the board there real quick from Melissa. It says this in Psalm 25. It says, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. Man, I tell you what, God has a secret. Isn't that cool? And he wants to share a secret. The word secret here, it actually means a very close companion. It's almost like someone leaning over and having a conversation. Actually, what it was, it was, a, it was someone that was brought, brought their friend into a tent and they were having just quiet conversation inside the tent. He was sharing, sharing intimate things, sharing secrets, sharing things together. It says, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear Him. And He will show them His what? Covenant. God wants to demonstrate to you and show you the covenant. Now look what it says in the Amplified. I want you to see this. The secret of the sweet, satisfying companionship of the Lord have they who fear and reverence and worship Him. And He will show them His covenant and reveal to them its deep inner meaning. Deep inner meaning. You hear this word a lot in Christianity, guys. We got a covenant with God. We got a covenant with God. You got a covenant with the Lord. And we hear these things. God is a covenant God. He always, He always, He's always has a covenant, has kept covenant. Listen, the Bible says that Jesus was, was, was a lamb that was sacrificed before the foundation of the world. God has always revolved Himself around covenant. So it behooves us as Christians to learn what it means to be in covenant with God. God has a secret. So in the Western mindset, we don't understand covenant, okay? We really don't. So, but covenant is the operating system of God. It's His economy. God does all things through covenant. How can I pray and get answers in the name of Jesus? Covenant. Uh, how, how is it that when I stand and rebuke the enemy, he flees from me? Covenant. How is it that I can pray for the sick and see him recover? Covenant. How is it I have inheritance of healing and prosperity and peace and blessings? How is that? Through covenant. Do you know the enemy? He, listen, he don't want you to have an understanding of covenant. Do you get this? I mean, Abraham, and I'll show you this as we move forward. But Abraham is over here in Genesis 15. He goes and, 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 and God says, I want you to go and take some rams. I want you to take some turtle doves. I want you to prepare the sacrifice. And it says that Abraham was shooing away the birds away from the sacrifice. Before God put him to sleep, he was shooing the birds away. The bird here is, all, is, is a type of Satan. Satan knows if he can come and destroy covenant and an understanding of covenant, he's got you where you, he's got you. Am I making sense to you? So, so the devil doesn't want you to understand it. So it's the knowledge of covenant that our faith is rooted in. So what is covenant? I talked about this last week. I'm just kind of getting us caught up. What is covenant? It means the word covenant means to cut till bleeding occurs. It means to cut until bleeding occurs. It means to bind together. It's a binding obligation, okay? It's an agreement between two people established in blood. It's established in blood. So covenant, in the biblical sense, when we see it in Scripture, it implies much more than a contract or simple agreement. A contract always has an end date, while a covenant is a permanent agreement. Stay with me now. Another difference is that a contract generally involves only one part of a person such as a skill, while a covenant covers the person's entire being. Covenant is not negotiable. A contract can be negotiated. A contract can be negotiated. A covenant cannot. Contracts can be canceled. A covenant cannot. Contracts are easily broken because the promises are only as good as the character of the people that's signing the bottom of the contract. So a contract is not the same as covenant. Covenant is a binding blood agreement between two parties. Other definitions. It's a blood bond broken only by death. Made with a sacred oaths. 
It, it always has a company's oaths or terms with it. It's an unbreakable agreement. It's unending loyalty and faithfulness. It's complete union between two parties. I love this. In which all responsibilities, liabilities, and assets are held mutual. So guess what? When I got born again and you got born again, you entered into a covenant with Almighty God through Jesus Christ and you gave Him all your liabilities and received all of His assets. That's good gospel news. That's the good news. So covenant is a, is a universal language. In the most primitive civilizations, you can go anywhere in the world and people have a concept of covenant. Today, in many any uh, primitive uh, third world countries, they are still cutting covenant. They're still cutting covenant. Amen? So, in order for the secret to be revealed, we need to be covenant conscious. Now, go with me to Genesis chapter 15. You've got to be covenant conscious. Say that with me. Say covenant conscious. You've got to be covenant conscious. Genesis chapter 15. I told you we were going to go to Bible school, right? So we're going to go to Bible school, okay? So we're going to get into some things here, deep things. So it's going to be good, amen? I don't want to be deep for the sake of just being deep, okay? That's not what I'm saying at all. I've got to fix this real quick. I'm sorry. I'm having a little problems. I've got some world, uh, wardrobe malfunctions here. All right. Genesis chapter 15. Let's read here in verse 1. This is God coming to Abraham and making covenant with Abraham. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Now, I ain't going to go into this tonight, but this is covenant language. Very much so. And I'll show you this as we move forward in this series. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? And Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but the one who will come from your own body will be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars, if you're able to number them. And he said to them, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and it accounted to him for what? For righteousness. Understand something. Abraham believed God. He, was a, he, he had faith. That's what the Jewish... How, do, how did the Jewish race, how did it begin? It began through faith. It began through faith. That's why Ishmael is not considered part of the seed of Abraham because he wasn't of faith. That's why Abraham is the father of faith. Because he believed God. Now let's move on here. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. Now look what Abraham said in verse 8. He said, Lord God, how shall I what? How shall I be confident? Now, this is good, Lord. You're telling me all this stuff. That's awesome that you're telling me all this stuff. But how can I know? And the goodness of God kicks in. How should I know? How can I have confidence and complete trust that I will inherit it? Verse 9. What happened? Verse 9. So he said to him, what? Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Now, what, what, is, what is going on here? What's being said? Covenant. Isn't it amazing that God didn't have to tell Abraham? If you go and read on the next one, go to verse 10. We could just go to verse 10 real quick. Then he brought all these to him, and he cut them in two pieces down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. How did he know that? How did he? God didn't give him instructions on how to cut a covenant. He didn't instruct him anything about this covenant. He just knew to do it. Why? He came from a place, a pr all primitive uh, of civilizations knew what covenant was. Why? Because God, it's God is the originator of covenant. Now, now, listen to me now. So, so Abraham, Abram says, okay, God, I, I want to know. I want to know that all this is true. So what's God do? He gives him what? He gives him a covenant. 
Do you know how you know how you know the promises of God are true for you? Because you've got a covenant. Because you've got a covenant. Now look, go, go with me to Hebrews chapter 6. Keep your hand here. So, so covenant brings assurance to me. I can believe and act in faith because covenant. Now in Hebrews chapter 6, you can see up on the board, it says, thus God. Actually, go up to verse 16. Remember to last week I talked about how there's different, today there's, 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 there's uh, things in our culture that shows us covenant, like the high five and the raising of the hand. Now look, it says, for indeed, for men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. You go to the courthouse, well they have. A Bible, and you lay your hand on the, right? You lay your hand, you raise your right hand, what do you say? Promise to what? Tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, what? So see, you swear by the greater. Okay? And it's an end to all dispute. Are you disputing about the promise of God for your life? Well, I know that God, I know that God heals some, but he won't, you know, I, I just don't know if he'll heal me. Well, I know God will bless so-and-so, but I don't know if he'll bless me. See, you're disputing what the word says. Now look in verse 17. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise. Who's the heirs of promise? That's you and I. The immutability of his counsel or the unchangeability, the unchangeableness of his counsel confirmed it by what? The word oath here is covenant. Okay? Because see, that's one of the, I'll show you how, how they, there was nine steps that they took in order to cut a covenant. But one of the things they done was they declared an oath. They gave the terms of the contract. He, he, he confirmed it by covenant. Now look what it says in verse 18. That by two immutable things, God's promise, just like he told Abram, he's actually referring back to Abram. He's told him, gave him the promise, but he also confirmed it with, a, with the oath, with the covenant, so he gave him his word, plus he cut the covenant with him. That by two immutable things, in which it's already impossible for God to lie, he can't lie anyway. We might have strong consolation. We can bet strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. What's he telling you? Listen, God's made a promise. He's got a covenant for you. That way he's not going to change. Come on. There's promises for you and I to take a hold of. Why? Because we're in covenant with almighty God. We're in covenant with him. God can't change. He's, he doesn't lie. But he says, listen, I'm going to give you my word. And I'm going to back up my word with a blood covenant. That's why Abraham was able to lay his son down on an altar. He understood blood covenant. He was so sure of his covenant with God. He said, if he does die, God will raise him up. This is where we read. This is the Bible, guys. Listen, this is why we read about these normal people, everyday people that were doing great things for God. You know why? Because they understood their partnership with God. They understood their covenant with the Lord. They understood their friendship with God. They understood that, listen, God's going to back up his word. God's going to stay there. You can bet your bottom dollar. Amen. If you, if you was betting. Now, don't go and bet and say it's covenant with the Lord. Am I making sense to you? So in Bible times, blood covenant was sealed with oaths. So that's why it says in Psalm 89, 34, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that's gone from my lips. Stay with me, okay? Just stay with me. So, let's talk a little bit about covenant headship, just for a few moments. In order to understand covenant, we have to understand the covenant heads. Now, we're going to take two different, uh, two different uh, scenarios. 
We have in Adam and in Christ. In Adam and in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Look what it says up here on the board. I want you to see this. I want you to, if you want to get write it down in your Bible, but I want you to see it. It refers to two different covenant heads or two different heads, representatives. For as who? In Adam, all die. Even so, in Christ, all shall be made alive. All shall be made alive alive so Adam was our natural head we were all in him all of human race was in Adam in the garden so when Adam sinned guess what we sinned why because he is our head he's our federal head he is the one that all of humanity is represented in naturally that's why the Bible says things like this listen to me now so, so, so through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men. So when Adam sinned, all of humanity sinned because of the action of the one man. So we're going to all answer for our own sins, right? We're all, if you don't accept Christ, you're going to answer for your sins. Right now, I'm righteous. Amen. Come on, somebody. I'm in Christ. I'm in a different head. But, but we're all going to, we will answer for our sins committed in our flesh, but we are made sinners and found guilty in Adam, our head. Listen to me now, it's very important. This is what makes the virgin birth so very important. Listen now, the virgin birth. See, why? Because if you deny the virgin birth, you place Christ in direct, the direct lineage of Adam. Which means what? He's not sinless. He's not sinless. Now notice, where does sin get passed through? Through man. That's why Jesus could be born of a woman because the seed of sin is passed through man. That's the way God gets around this whole deal to get his son in the earth to redeem all of, human, all of humanity, all mankind. So all of us in the natural are, are descendants of Adam. He is the head. We're all in him. We are, we, listen, we're still feeling the effects of still being in Adam. Have you checked yourself recently? Right? Death is a part of the fall. Amen. So, that's Adam. Now, thank God. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says, In Adam all die, but in who? In Christ all are made alive. He is our representative head. The spiritual head. The one that takes our place. He legally represents man in covenant. Now, when I say in Christ, what does that actually mean? To be in Christ. It's my union with him. It's my union. It's my oneness with Christ. My union with him. My oneness with him. My history or his history becomes my history. Yeah, so it means what? So listen, vitally, I'm in him. So when he died, guess who, guess who also died? I died with him. When he was resurrected, who was resurrected? You and I. So his history actually becomes my history. Because of why? He becomes my head. I am in Christ. So whatever happens to the head, is affected. Every, everybody's affected by the head. All I got to do is get in faith, believe him, accept him as my Savior. I come out of Adam and get in Christ. Now it releases the benefits of the covenant in my life. Stay with me now. So we're vitally in and part of the historical events that took place to him, in, place to him and his present day ministry. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be what? In Christ. Your head. Your head. 2, 2 Corinthians 2, 14. Thanks be unto God, which always causes, the, causes it to triumph in Christ. Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through... Through my head, through my covenant head, which is Christ. Now, this is real interesting. Now, 1 Samuel, I want you to go back with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel 17. All right, so this is what we're talking about, covenant. I know right now we're, we're just kind of just trying to get through this right here. Because I, I need you to understand what it means to be in Christ, in your head. 
because whatever happens to him happens to me. It's going to make a whole lot of sense two weeks from now or three weeks from now when I start talking to you about the benefits. Because why? You're going to understand that I'm in Christ. And I can draw the benefits because I'm in him. It's got nothing to do with me. It's got everything to do with him. Now look what it says in 1 Samuel 17. Uh, yeah, let's look here in verse 8. Now this is that same story about David and Goliath. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself. Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. Now hold on a second. That's not the way that we fight. I mean, you've got an army. Send down the army. No, he says, Goliath understands covenant. No, send a representative down to me. Send a man. Send a head. A covenant head. Give me a covenant representative. All of Israel will be in that man. And all the Philistines are going to be in me. Listen, this battle's going to be won, not by everybody else, but by two people coming and fighting. Are you with me here? Are you, are you seeing this now? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. Verse 9. For if he's able to fight with me and kill me, listen to personal pronouns. If he, not they, he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. So all of Israel is in David. And all the Philistines are in Goliath. Now, are you getting this now? The whole issue is going to be settled by two people that will embody their people. So look, now look what happened. So we know, right? We know what David did. Now look, now what was going on for six weeks? What was the children of Israel doing? Hiding, fearful. Now look in verse, I think, what is it, 52? Look what it says. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his what? Isn't it interesting? He cut off his head. He was proving that this head, Jesus is David, it, he is the seed of David, that this head is greater than that head. Now let me give you a little nugget of something here. It's pretty interesting. David, if you go and read it, David carried the, the skull of, of David 18 miles to Jerusalem. Now, 18 miles. We, I mean, we, we don't have cars. We don't we'll put that in the back of the trunk, you know what I'm saying? And we'll, you know what I mean, put it on ice. I don't know what they did, right? I mean, I mean, this is 18 miles. How many days did it take him to go 18 miles? I don't know, all day. I mean, you, I mean, you go and you have something, blood, a bloody head. Could you imagine just carrying this thing? I love the Bible, man. This is awesome. This is some great stuff. And he's like, yes. Glory to God. Carrying that thing. He takes it to Jerusalem. Hmm. Where was Jesus crucified? On a hill. And it was called what? Gold, Gotha. Well, whose head did he have? Goliath. Where was he from? Gath. Could it be, could it be, could it be that God in his great majesty, because the Bible says in Matthew 27 that Jesus was crucified not at the place of the skulls, but at the place of a skull. Could it be God in his great plan that the, that the very tree, the cross, was going to be lowered right down on top of the head? Come on, somebody. Because one of the things they done in covenant at the very end, they planted a tree and they sprinkled blood on the tree. 
Come on, somebody. You seeing this symbolism? I mean, I, I, I don't know. I can't prove that, but it's awful fishy. And it's just like God. Wouldn't it be less like God, like laughing? Because the Bible says in Genesis 3, when he began to pronounce about all this stuff, when Adam sinned, he said, listen, now I'm going to send the seed of a woman, right? The seed of a woman, not the seed of man, because the seed of sin has passed through man. He said, the way I'm going to get around all this stuff, he said, I'm going to get this thing. I'm going to get inside of a virgin womb. I'm going to birth a sinless man. He's going to walk this earth sinless. He's going to be the final substitute and sacrifice for all of humanity, for all of sin. And he said, listen, this seed of the woman is going to come. And that seed is going to bruise. You're, you're going to, that seed's going to crush your head and you will bruise his heel. Oh, come on, somebody. Could it be not like God to put that David carrying 18 miles back to Jerusalem, plants it in the ground, not even knowing what he's doing, but God knowing there's going to be a tree uh, planted there that his son was going to lay down his life as a sacrifice and covenant. He's going to plant a tree, and that blood was going to run down and going to land right on top of the head of the serpent of the enemy. Because, see, Goliath, uh, listen, Goliath, Goliath, Satan is always a, he perverts things. He's not a creator. So the Bible says in Genesis 3 that I, I'm going to, God says, I'm going to send a seed. So all of a sudden now, Satan says, well, I'm going to send a seed. Well, where's the seed? I believe the seed of the serpent was the giant's. The giants, the race of giants started by the fallen, I don't want to go into this. The, 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 the giants came, according to Genesis chapter 6, and there's another scripture too. There was two different eruptions of fallen angels. And they come down and mingle with the daughters of men and produce the race of giants. That was Satan's seed. David completely evacuated the land of all the giants. Who was in David? Who was in David? The seed of the woman. Am I making sense to you? I'm talking about covenant. Because all of Israel was inside David. Now let's look. Go back here now and look what happened. Six weeks hiding out. Right? Six weeks. Now the men of Israel and Judah rose and shouted and pursued the Philistine as far as the entrance of the valley. We'll actually go back to verse 51. Therefore David ran and over the Philistine. I just love this. We just read it again. It's just all good again. Took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him. And cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their, their champion, their representative, their head, their covenant head, their covenant representative, the man they sent down, was dead. What happened? They fled. Now look what happened. Yeah, you, we and you be doing this right here. Now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley into the gates of Ekron and the wounded of the Philistines and for along the road to Sharam, even as far as the Gath and Ekron. Come on, somebody. Why? Because, see, when, listen, when, when, when the head got the victory, come on, they said, well, listen, it's our victory too. I'm going to go and I'm going to pursue. I'm going to overtake and I'm going to recover all. Why? Because my representative head has got the victory. Who's our representative head? It's Jesus Christ. And because he has the victory, we got the victory. Am I making sense to you? Are you seeing this? Boy, it's 10 after 7. Praise the Lord. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. All right. Can I show you something? And then I'll come back at some point. There's just so much. See, Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant. Romans 8, or Hebrews 8, tells us that. The word mediator is the guarantee. What they would call a person that came down and represented the rest of the family. It was called the guarantor. So he would guarantee. The guarantor. Okay, so, so I'm just saying. all the Let's just say this. Okay, let's try and make it down to our 
Uh, Rob Jeffries, okay? Rob Jeffries is the covenant head of his family. Okay? Come here, Rob. The covenant head right here. That's just Rob. And all of his family. I'm talking about brothers and if he had sisters. Sisters and aunts and uncles. And everybody is inside of Rob Jeffries. Everybody. So wherever Rob... So Rob is the guarantor for the rest of his family. So he has to make sure all the terms and the conditions and the promises are kept. If not, Rob... He's subject to death. Because he's not, te- he's not keeping up with his hint of the bargain. Am I making sense here? So listen. So the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 8 that Jesus is the mediator, the guarantee... Of a better covenant. He's the one that's guaranteeing you and I. That the promise of God are true. To you and I. Why? Because of covenant. Let me show you this. Go to 2 Samuel. If you'll give me five. And you give me five. And I'll take five. And then we'll call it a night. That's Pastor Jim. Pastor Jim always said that. Didn't he Kath? You give me five, I'll take five, and we'll call it a night. Now look, go with me. This is really jumping the gun, but I want you to see this. I want you to take this with you tonight. Because I'm talking about covenant heads. You've got to understand, listen, before you was in Christ, you was in Adam. Right? And in Adam all die. He was the natural head. So whatever happened to Adam happened to all of us. Well, I didn't think this was fair at all. I mean, come on. I mean, you know, I mean, I didn't do anything to get a part of this. It doesn't matter. He's the head. So in, we were all in Adam. So we received everything that Adam received. But thank God for Jesus. Because now he becomes my spiritual head that will redeem me out of that and put me over here into a better covenant based on better promises. And he's the guarantor. Everybody is, all of humanity is in Jesus too. Come on, somebody. The Bible says, he that knew no sin became our sin. When he went on the, when he went on the cross, he was there. He was there as you and me. Now look at this. Now let me catch you caught up right here real quick. 1 Samuel 18. You can look at it later, write down your notes. David killed, the Goli- killed Goliath, the, the giant. And the Bible says that Jonathan saw David. And him and he loved David. He said, man, I want to be that guy right there has got something on him. Now Saul was the king. Jonathan was his son. So Jonathan was the prince. He was the rightful heir to the throne. However, he knew that David had something on him. So the Bible says he cut a covenant. He cut covenant with David. Now, we can't go into all this. I'll show you at some point about what they did to, and all the rituals and it's power for the stuff that's in it. And, and they cut covenant. Well, Dave and Jonathan had this covenant forever. And the Bible says that Jonathan died. David lamented, cried, and wailed for his covenant partner. However, he still had a covenant with Jonathan. He said, listen, so he picks it up here in verse 2 Samuel 9, we know that first, first and foremost, 2 Corinthians, or 2, 2 Samuel, I want to say 2 Chronicles, 2 Samuel 4, that Jonathan had a son. His name was Mephibosheth. His name was Mephibosheth. Now what had happened, Saul hated David, hated him, chucking javelins at him, <laughs> hated him. Saul was a madman. He hated David. So poor Mephibosheth. I mean, if you're growing up in a home, even though Jonathan was his dad, Grandpa still had influence. He was the king. So all he heard was how bad David was. And David wants the throne. And, and David's, he's going to kill you, boy, if he ever finds you. And, and don't you ever, listen, if you ever see him, you make sure you run from David. You get away from David. You make sure you have somebody carry you away from David. So David, after Jonathan dies, David says, listen, is there not someone else left of the house of Jonathan, the house of Saul, that I could show kindness to? 
Let's pick it up right here in verse 1. Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? For whose sake? Why? Why for Jonathan's sake? Why? Because he had a covenant with Jonathan. And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, At your service. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. It's very interesting. Because Jonathan had a son. Now let me ask you a question. Was Mephibosheth, and you'll, you'll see it in a minute when we introduce him to you. When Mephibosheth, when, when this was going on, was Mephibosheth around? No. When, God, when Jonathan and Saul, or Jonathan and David made a covenant, was Mephibosheth around? No. Because why? Mephibosheth was inside of Jonathan. Jonathan was the covenant head. Stay with me. So the king said to him, verse 4, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Machor, the son of Emiel, in Lodibar. The king David sent and brought him out of the house of Machor, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Here is your servant. So, the, so David said to him, what? So if he's new not fear, why is he doing this? Why is he fearful? Because he's heard all this time that David was going to get me. This is, why he, this is why he's got hurt. The Bible says Mephibosheth was lame in his legs. Why? Because when Jonathan and David, or Jonathan and Saul, were killed, Ziba took him and ran from the palace because they thought David was going to come and kill him. And when he was running, the Bible says he dropped Mephibosheth as a child and it crushed his legs. So he's lame. So all of a sudden he can't run. David's looking for him. The king's looking for him. Now all of a sudden he's like fearful saying, Oh my gosh, I've talked bad about you and I've done all kinds of stuff to you and, and, I, and I, 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 didn't, I, don't, I, I don't know anything about you and, and I've been told a lot of bad stuff about you and I, I've, 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 just, I've talked bad about you, David. I, I, I didn't want anything to do with you, David. Fearful. So he said to him, Fear not, for I will surely... Show you kindness for what? Jonathan, your father's sake. And will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then he bowed himself and said, What is, what is your servant? And you should look upon such a dead dog as I. See, it's this condemnation and shame. cursed you David I've cursed you David how could you ever have anything to want you'd want anything to do with me the king said to Ziba Saul's servant and said to him I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house notice he didn't he didn't say anything to Jonathan or to Mephibosheth at all about his stuff he completely ignored it he said it doesn't really matter what you've done I'm not here because of you I'm here because of Jonathan. I'm here because of the covenant head. Now that's going to make good sense. You're going to shout. Don't you run, John, after I share this in a minute. Verse 10. You therefore and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my Lord the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do. And as for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table. And he was lame in both of his feet. He was sitting here. 
lame. Now listen. There's three people in this story that's talked about. Four. Saul, Jonathan, David, and Mephibosheth. And all four of them represent something different. First, Saul. Saul hated David. He's fallen humanity. Saul is a type of fallen humanity. Shaking their fist at God. I don't want anything to do with you. I'll do whatever I can to stop you. You have David, which is a type of God. And you have Jonathan, which is a type of Jesus. And Mephibosheth, which is all of us. Now listen to me, church. I'm I'm closing. It's late. Listen. David, God, says, is there not somebody? See, Jonathan... He was in the house of Saul, but he really wasn't of the house of Saul. He was more of David because of his covenant. See, Jesus came to this earth. He was a type of Jonathan. He was in the world, but not of the world. And David come down, is there not somebody that I can show kindness to? Is there not somebody that I could come and show my kindness to? So yeah, there's Mephibosheth. He's lame in his feet. He said, bring him to me. God has a covenant with Jesus. And you and I are lame in our feet. However, we're all inside of our covenant head we're inside of Christ and notice he's lame in his feet there's nothing that that Mephibosheth could ever do to make himself to do anything it's not about you it's about Jesus if you notice at the very end of the, at the chapter what did it say at the very end So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both of his feet. Which means what? He started out lame. He's going to continue to be lame, which means this. It's not telling you that you're going to be lame, per se. You don't have covenant rights. It's saying this. You can never do anything to get it. You'll never be able to do anything good enough to keep it. Are you with me? Mephibosheth. Is you and I. And we are inside. Of our covenant head. We're in Christ. And notice. When we get underneath the table. Nobody sees the brokenness anymore. Don't see the brokenness anymore. Is that Leland sings that song right? Carried to the table. Seated where I don't belong. Seated at the table, swept away by his love, something like that. And, he, and I don't see my brokenness anymore because I'm seated at the table of the Lord. Are you with me, church? Are you understand what I'm saying? Because, see, listen, you are in Christ. You are in Christ. And you and I have benefits that you and I can draw from. How could God ever love me? I've I've shook my fist at him. I'm just an old dog. What did David do? He paid no mind to that. He said, I'm not here because of you anyway. I'm here because of your covenant head. I'm going to be good to you because, not because of what you can do. I'm going to be good to you because Jesus is good. I'm going to be good to you because I have a covenant with with, with, with my son Jesus. And because of that, Come on, eat at my table forever. He said he ate at the table of the king continually. Come on, somebody. You got it? Are you understanding this? It's not about what you can do. I said it's not about what you can do. 
Quit working to try to get something that already belongs to you. You say, well, how do I get it? You raise your hands to God. Come on, everybody stand to your feet tonight. And let's just raise our hands to God. And you say, Father, I thank you for covenant. Father, this is how you receive from God. This is the part of faith that we're missing. This is the part of faith that we're missing. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. Father, we thank you tonight, God, for your covenant. We receive, Lord God, all the benefits in the covenant because we're in Christ. We're in Christ. We are in Christ. We're in the covenant head. We're in Him. And Father, just like David, you ride in. You said, is there not someone that I can show kindness to? From the house of Saul. From fallen humanity. I have a covenant with Jonathan. And he has a son. And it's got nothing to do with the son. It's got everything to do with Jonathan. I'm here because of Jonathan's sake. Father, right now, I can't help but be thankful and grateful. Lord, we're all in this room lame. We can't help ourselves. If you did try to make a covenant with us, within the first hour of the covenant, we'd already have it broken. We'd already have it broken. Your word says you made a covenant with yourself. And this thing will never ever end. It will never die. The one way the covenant, Father God, is broken is by death. By someone dying. But Lord Jesus, you are alive and you will never die. And you, Lord God, are the covenant head, Jesus. And we're in you. We're in you. And there's nothing we can do to get you to love us more. We receive right now by faith, just like Abraham. By faith, Abraham received. And it was accounted to him as righteousness. We believe by faith. By faith, we speak the mountains because of covenant. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. We receive, God, the benefits of covenant. We receive healing. We receive. We thank you, God, tonight for healing. We thank you, God, tonight, Lord God, for peace of mind. It belongs to us in the covenant. We draw on the covenant, God, tonight. We lay down the Isaacs. Thank you, Lord. So Lord, I thank you so much. Glory be to God. With every head bowed, every eyes closed, you say tonight, tonight, Pastor Paul, I've never accepted Christ. Never. And I want to accept Him. So how do I get a part of this covenant? By faith, by accepting Jesus. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. You say to me tonight, Pastor Paul, I need Jesus. Would you lift your hand up real quick? I'll come to you tonight, I promise. I'll come to you. Don't want to embarrass you. Just want you to lift your hand up real quick. That's me. I need Jesus. I need, I need the Lord. Glory be to God. So Father, right now, Father, right now, help us all to understand and realize that this massive word, God, this one word with so much weight, called covenant we thank you for it Lord. when I'm seated at the table I don't see my brokenness anymore I don't see my sin anymore I don't see it anymore so I thank you God tonight hallelujah Jesus we love you glory be to God in Jesus' name.